So thanks again uh, for joining us today. The peptide we're going to talk about today is called Kispeptin. And a lot of you all might be familiar from Kispeptin because it's been used in the integrated medicine space a little bit uh, over the past seven months or so. Uh, but I really want to bring it up again because it's sort of um, a key peptide in, in a lot of different mechanisms. Um, and it's sort of a lot of different things which are pretty uh, popular in the integrative medicine space right now. Uh, just to give a little bit of background on it before we go into the updates, which recently came out on December 31st, um, I, I just want to go over sort of, sort of what we know about it and what we have known about it and a little bit of its history. Um, as you might surmise, the Kispeptin um, peptide was actually discovered based on the Kispeptin gene uh, in Hershey's, Pennsylvania, and sort of how it's got its name, Kiss. The gene um, that encodes the Kispeptin peptide is actually Kiss1. Um, and again, it was discovered in actually 1996, so it's still relatively recent. Um, and it really at the time had uh, was discovered whenever actually doing cancer research. They found that whenever they transfected uh, chromosome 6 uh, into a cancer cell, it actually limited its ability to metastasize. So at first, uh, whenever they discovered Kispeptin, they thought it might have a pretty good effect as a cancer therapeutic. Um, unfortunately, it's not sort of how we're using it now, but we found a lot since then. Actually, in 1999, three years later, um, they sort of discovered the receptor for Kispeptin, um, and it's actually a G-coupled cellular receptor called GTR54. Um, and there's a lot of work being done. I'm going to sort of do a broad hand wave about what's happened in its history um, until we get to sort of 2003, where they discovered what we now know is the most important function of Kispeptin um, and its different variant peptides, Kispeptin 10, Kispeptin 54. Um, they discovered that this actually, this peptide works in, uh, in the, also the receptor works in sexual function regulation. Um, and so what they found is actually whenever this was a whenever there's a knockout receptor of the GTR54, or there was a um, problem with kispeptin synthesis, uh, that there was actually a decreased amount of sex steroids and gonadotropin. Um, and so this is uh, sort of how again, just even as re most recently as 2003, sort of isolated its function. Um, in in 2014, um, it actually just uh, was proved to be a result that Kispeptin affected the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone. Again, this was sort of um, always sort of hypothesized, but finally proved in a study in 2014. Um, and so they, what they essentially showed is that Kispeptin um, binds to the Kis1 receptor, which is that GPR54, um, and initiates the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus, which then stimulates the release of FSH and LH on the pituitary. So um, immediately you can see sort of how this affects the clinical space, right? Um, you know, a lot of things we do in the integrated medicine space, which revolve around hormone replacement, uh, you know, we use HCG. And again, a summary about HCG, HCG is a large protein, but it has a, a beta subdomain, which really mimics LH. And a lot of people take this to stimulate, um, you know, Leibig cell production and, and maintain testicular function uh, whenever you're doing exogenous testosterone production. And what we know is if you don't do that, um, you can sort of have testicular atrophy, which and the volume of those uh, Leibig cells never really... Uh, get back to normal. So you can have sort of irreversible uh, volume loss. Beyond that, we also know that if you dose too much HCG or stimulate that receptor too much, uh, you can actually develop a little bit of a, a, a down regulation to that. So, um, you know, it's important to, you know, dose HCG in not too high volumes or not too often um, if you want to maintain uh, the function. So maybe conception could be used uh, as sort of an on and off uh, rotation for that to sort of synthesize the receptors and sort of go upstream a little bit. Um, this right here, this Kispeptin uh, image, it sort of goes over the, the whole pathway as they knew it in 2014, and, and that's been reviewed in, in uh, Nature Urology since then. Um, and if you look at, again, the RQA nucleus, uh, these neurons are actually referred to as K and D gamma because they're usually secreted with neurokine and D um, and dynorphin, which uh, is, again, the, the, uh, the D in that K and D neuron. And it all affects uh, the gonadotropin releasing hormone, and then it goes downstream. Um, and again, just to sort of go over it, it, Kispeptin doesn't have a ton of research in any one area, but it has multiple human studies in a couple areas, and that is uh, treatment for hi primary hypogonadism, um, you know, how it can relate to increasing testosterone levels in, in men, um, and then how it can also be used to help with ovulation and egg implementation in women um, as fertility methods. So I would highly recommend you uh, review some of these studies. If you'd ever like some, please just, uh, you can comment on anywhere on the Facebook page and we'll get back to you uh, with some of those primary literature sources. Um, the other thing we, I just want to sort of go over are the updates. And this is the sort of exciting thing is 
Um, while the, you know, 2014 wasn't too long ago, but that's when we, we confirmed the GNRH stimulatory effect. Uh, now we're really seeing that cassettin also has an intimate role as it relates to metabolism, metabolism in the metabolic process. Um, and so I've sort of copied uh, on, on some of the text you'll, you'll definitely read whenever we post this, it, uh, a, a bit from the study which shows that um, cassettin has a regulation um, that is affected by nutritional changes, fasting, puberty, pregnancy, menopause, stress, and physical activity. All of these things affect levels, cassettin levels. And, uh, and as a result, cassettin has also been shown to have um, roles in, in, in acting sort of as an energy sensor in the whole POMC and neuropeptide Y pathway. Um, and so it, it, it's pretty cool. We see um, that it can be sort of the sensor that affects all these downstream pathways. Um, and that, again, it's all mi mitigated by neuron stimulation. So uh, one of the cool things we see is that the physical activity actually correlates to cassettin level. Um, and if looking at moderate versus physical activity um, and how it relates to cassettin level, there's actually a 23% reduction in cassettin uh, in, in high physical activity as compared to moderate physical activity, um, and inverse relationship between ghrelin and cassettin. So again, we know it's working um, at a lot of different factors on the metabolic level. Um, and again, I just wanted to show uh, one of the studies um, graphics of this, which talks about sort of its uh, pre-optic area um, stimulation of the uh, reproductive regulation, and then it's also in the arcuate nucleus with metabolic regulation, and how it's affecting those um, neuropeptide Y POMC pathways. And again, this is uh, if, if you're pretty big into the integrated space, you, you can know that things that we have peptides like uh, you know um, the Bremland type PT141 or Melanotan2, which are alpha MSH mimicking, also affect appetite regulation. And so um, you know it goes into a larger picture of all the different things we use in therapy, but um, Again, just to sort of reiterate, cassettin and its receptors are primarily expressed in the hypothalamus. Uh, the expression of cassettin um, decreases in the presence of leptin deficiency, um, and injections of leptin can actually reduce appetite and uh, expression of, of leptin as well. And then lastly, um, and this one I think probably has some further implications into a really top popular topic, which is the fasting mimicking diet, because cassettin um, mRNA levels actually significantly drop following nutritional restriction. So maybe, uh, you know, this could be used as a as part of a therapy or to optimize the timing with the fasting mimicking diet um, that we hear so much about. Um, and so again, we're not really there yet to make any clinical decisions, but it's definitely something to keep updated on. Um, the one thing I wanna do talk about um, is a study published on December 31st, which looked at whether or not these correlations were result of glycogen in the brain. As we talked about, as it relates to physical activity and nutritional status, um, the idea is that uh, glycogen in the brain might be the sensor which affects the stimulation of these neurons. Um, and so the study uh, that was done in, actually in Iran looked at the, uh, and it's titled The Response of Brain Conception and Glycogen at Different Times to Acute Aerobic Exercise with and Without Glucose Pollution Consumption in Male Wind Star Rats. Um, so it basically is like saying, hey, is glycogen the sensor in the brain which affects these neurons and regulates appetite, cassettin levels, and maybe even uh, the ghrelin leptin pathway. Um, and uh, what we saw is that, um, unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, while we're hoping glycogen might be the sensor, it turns out that there has to be another sensor because glycogen did not, uh, levels in the brain did not affect the level of cassettin and how it uh, stimulated um, its downstream pathways. So unfortunately, it was a, a sort of a negative result study, but it definitely rules out um, glycogen as being the sensor before the cassettin sensor. Um, and so again, just to summarize, uh, we'll always keep you up to date if we hear any more about cassettin as it relates to either reproductive um, regulation or metabolic regulation. But the things we do know is that cassettin stimulates uh, GnRH release from uh, its neurons in the, in the pituitary and the hypothalamus. Um, therapeutically, it can be used to stimulate ov ovulation or increase testosterone and LH levels. Um, and it might be an alternative or an addition to HCG protocols. Um, the other thing we know is that it decreases with physical activity and fasting, and it's inversely related to ghrelin. And then lastly, but not least, glycogen is not the sensor which uh, helps cassettin uh, to upregulate or downregulate. And we're still looking for the mechanism by which that happens. So again, we'll always keep you up to date. If you have any questions or want to see any of the primary literature that we have on this, uh, please just uh, comment and we'll get it to you. Thanks so much.